Has the world gone crazy? Life is difficult. When you need help, where do you turn? Are you willing? Are you willing to let him blow on the coals of your heart? Are you willing? Are you willing to ignite that flame? To let him blow and ignite that flame? And set you on fire. And set you on fire to consume this county, to consume this state, to consume this world. Welcome. Christian Impact, impacting your life with spiritual truth. I am Dr. Kelly Blanton, and I'm sharing practical truths in the Bible that can truly change your life. Today is January 24th, 2024. We continue our series called Kingdom Legacy, and we are on Song of Solomon, chapter 3. I ask your forgiveness as we go forward as my Voice is still very raspy and very raw from all the dust storms and sinus and throat issues that I've had the last couple of weeks. But praise God, we're on the other side. And if you can bear with me, we're going to go through Song of Solomon chapter 3. If I could title this a title, I would call it The Dark Night of the Soul. Chapter 1, I'd entitled Intimacy and Chapter 2, Come Away. But we're going to talk about those dark nights that Christians can face. But before I get into that, let's go ahead and read Song of Solomon, Chapter 3. By night on my bed, I sought the one I love. I sought him, but I did not find him. I will rise now, I said, and go about the city In the streets and in the squares, I will seek the one I love. I sought him, but I did not find him. The watchmen who go about the city found me. I said, have you seen the one I love? Scarcely had I passed by them when I found the one I love. I held him and would not let him go until I had brought him to the house of my mother, into the chamber of her who conceived me. I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or by the does of the field, do not stir up nor awaken love until it pleases. Who is this coming out of the wilderness like pillars of smoke, perfumed with myrrh and frankincense, with all the merchants' fragrant powders? Behold, it is Solomon's couch with sixty valiant men around it. Of the valet of Israel, they all hold swords, being experts in war. Every man has his sword on his thigh because of fear in the night. Of the wood of Lebanon, Solomon the king made himself a palaquin. He made it of pillars of silver, its support of gold, its seat of purple, its interior paved with love by the daughters of Jerusalem. Go forth, O daughters of Zion, and seek King Solomon with the crown with which his mother crowned him on the day of his wedding the day of gladness of his heart. And so this chapter begins following the last chapter. Now in the last chapter, chapter 2, we ended with this come away, almost like the end of Revelation, come Lord Jesus, come. And we talked about the idea of the come away, come away with me. And chapter 3 begins, but by night on my bed I sought the one I love but did not find him. And so this portion begins in at night. It's at night. It's a time of darkness. It's a dark time spiritually. And this is important because as chapter 2 ended, there was this come away, the groom saying, come away with me. And suddenly the the night is here and the bride is alone, not with the groom. In other words, The groom might have been saying, come away, but it wasn't time to come away. Now the bride is alone because she didn't go away with him. Instead, she turns over in her bed and it is night and it is dark. And here the word night in the Hebrew is in the plural, meaning many nights. So there have been many nights on the bed. The bride is alone and she's seeking his presence but she cannot find him. And I like to entitle this The Dark Night of the Soul because as Christians, 
all of us will have times, <clears throat> excuse me, in our lives when we do not feel the presence of God. We do not feel the presence of the Holy Spirit. Now, God is always with us. He's always there. His Spirit is always with us. But we don't always feel the omnipresence of God. We feel His manifest presence, but not His omnipresence. And oftentimes it's in this darkness is when we misinterpret His Word, where we misinterpret our feelings, where we make mistakes because we feel alone. I often teach in our discipleship classes that we cannot trust our feelings. Our faith must be placed upon fact. What are the facts? God's Word is fact. God is truth. That's a fact. God's Word is true. It's a fact. It's a fact. Jesus died for my sins on the cross and He rose from the the dead is fact. These are facts about God. And we put our faith in His Word, in the fact of the resurrection of Christ, in the fact that God doesn't lie to us. We, we put our faith in those facts, not our feelings. If this was, think of this like an old coal engine train. And I say coal engine because you got the steam engine in the front. And the very next car attached to the engine is the coal. And they would shovel the coal into the the furnace, which would heat the steam engine and make the train go. And that coal car is like your faith. It has to be hooked up to the engine. And when and, and that engine is God. It's the fact of God, the fact of His Word. And that's what drives the train. The train is your life. And your feelings is like the caboose. If we hook up our faith to our feelings, the train doesn't go. The train doesn't go. <clears throat> our feelings are on the end. And if you ever had a little toy train as a kid, and I say as a kid in toy trains because as a small child you never played with the train on the tracks. You put it on the floor and you roll it around like a car. But one thing you might have noticed with a train that's all connected together is that you'd pull the head of it, you'd pull the engine. But no matter what you did with the engine, the whole back end was like a snake. It would whip all over the place. But you know what? It always followed the head. And eventually, when you pulled it straight instead of whipping around, the whole the whole train would straighten out, including the very end, the caboose. It would eventually get in line. Your feelings <clears throat> can lie to you. They can go all over the place, good or bad. But if you put your faith in the facts, eventually your feelings will come back around and line up as they should. But if we follow our feelings, we will be led astray and we don't go anywhere. And so likewise, <clears throat> here in this first verse, there are these many nights and it's very easily to feel rejected and to feel left behind. Verse two. So I will rise. Now I said, and go into the city and the streets and the squares and seek the one I love. I sought him, but did not find him. So oftentimes when we go in these seasons of, of, of darkness where we don't really feel the presence of the Lord and we, we, we're, we're feeling that, that, that sense of aloneness and we're, we want to seek him. We want to find him. And that's what this, this bride does. She wakes up, but notice as she goes about the city. Now the city here represents the governments of the world. You will never find Jesus in the governments of the world. And the streets represent pathways of deceptive religious teachings. This is where all sorts of ideas and human philosophy and demonic things can be found or in the streets. It's a very dangerous place. He's not found in the streets or the, the broadways because the way of God is a narrow path. Now, it's interesting to note also in the New Testament, Jesus gives parables about having a banquet at, at, at the end and the king wants people to be filled and he sends out his invitations and his house is still empty. So he sends his servants into the streets, the highways and byways. 
Understand, those are still the same interpretations. The streets are not good places. In other words, in Jesus' parable, he said the king will go into places that are not good with their deceptive teachings, and he will take people out of out of those places of deception to bring them into his home. It would not be acceptable under normal circumstances to invite such people. But because the people he invited rejected, he said, well, go to them. Go to those in the streets. Go to give them an invitation. So that's a little bit about the gospel, how God saves those who aren't savable. He, he, He goes after the wretched, the rejected, the poor, and the despised. But here, the bride attempts to find the Lord in the streets and in the city and does not find it. Many times Christians have been deceived. We begin to, we don't feel the spirit of God like we should. And it's very easy that we want to run to the government. We've seen that Christianity here in the U.S. We see that abortion is, is an evil. And so we try to correct abortion instead of taking the gospel and seeing people's hearts changed, we want to legislate it from the government. Now, in the free country, I, we need to be responsible and vote responsibly. But we have to understand our salvation isn't found in the government. We can't find religious freedom in our government. We should vote for it, but understand our salvation doesn't come from the government. We will not find the Lord in the government. Likewise, <clears throat> excuse me, In the deceptive practices, all these religious teachings and things. A lot of times people we learn, we want to, we're not feeling the Lord. So we, we, we run and we're, we're drawn to mysticism. We're drawn to new age and occultic practices, yoga, voodoo, uh, palm readers, astrology. Let me read that horoscope. Let me read the fortune out of the fortune cookie. It may sound harmless, but we begin to put ourselves into these situations where we begin to want other words. That's one reason why when the Spirit of God no longer speaks prophetically to a body of Christ, because we believe a deceptive word about God doesn't say things anymore, that, that hunger of needing to hear the bridegroom is still there. And if we don't fill it with hearing from God, then we will fill it with hearing from the enemy through humanistic philosophy, through deceptive religions. We, we will go somewhere to hear some voice. And so the bride looks in the streets, but it says she doesn't find him. Verse 3, the watchmen go about the city, found me, and said, have you seen the one I love? <clears throat> now here, the watchmen were soldiers. They were to be on the walls, and they were to protect the king and the city. Scripturally, we talk about the watchmen that stand on the walls, they keep watch. These watchmen are not on the walls. These are watchmen that are found going about the city. In other words, these aren't spiritually godly leadership here. These are godly leaders that are now finding themselves in the city, in the government, in that they're not where they should be, watching for the Lord instead they're they're looking for the Lord in the same places as bride is looking for the Lord in, in 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 the city in the government. There's a lot of churches that believe that they have to have government's approval to operate. I've met many pastors that they believe they have to have some form of a piece of paper and certification from a, a denomination to operate. I'm not against denominations, and our ministry does credential people. But ultimately, you're in ministry because of your calling, not because of a group of men. The, the denomination, your church or whatever, they should recognize the calling and give the credential based on the recognition of we see the hand of God, not on man-based approval. And so these watchmen, they, they can't help the bride. They have not seen the one she loves. And so they're unable to help her because they're caught up into everything too. You know, and these these watchmen, uh, Christians that go through the cities, have you ever met someone that they, they go from church to church to church? Whether it's every six months or every year, they're constantly hopping. 
always looking to for the newest fad or to be fed somewhere? Or what about to the you know, seminar to seminar to seminar, conference, conference to conference? Evangelist, evangelist, evangelist. They're always seeking a sign. They're always seeking a wonder. They're always seeking the move of God. It sounds really spiritual. But it's, it's not. This is the believer that's woken up in a dark night and they can't feel the presence. And so they're chasing. They're chasing signs and wonders. It is easy to be deceived when you're chasing. Because the Holy Spirit is always with you. Yes, we need to seek Him. But we cannot find him in the city or the streets. As it says here in Song of Solomon. He's not found there. He's always with us. And we see in the very next verse, it says, Scarcely had I passed by them when I found the one I love and held him and would not let him go. You see, he's always been there. He's always been with us. And sometimes suddenly in the moments we least expect it, there he is. There he is. He's there. The the greatest revival, some of the greatest awakenings is waiting for us as a nation and country is when we as believers realize he's with us right now. He's with you right now. You don't have to run, you know, to conference to conference, to church to church to church to church and hop around. You don't have to chase after some revival. The revival you need is with you right now. You need to, you need to turn and find him who's with you right now. He promised that he would never leave us or forsake us. Here the bride, she, once she passes by the city, these watchmen, the streets, once you get rid of them, that's when you can find the one you love. And so don't settle for something else other than Jesus. Don't settle. For these petty things. Don't settle for some second class uh, philosophy. Don't settle for some second class human government. We shouldn't settle for anything less than Jesus and he's with us. We don't need, quote unquote, toxic relationships. We don't need authoritarian uh, religious of Jesus is with us right now. And when we find him, we should hold on to him and tight. Well, where do we find him? You know, notice it goes, goes, I held him and would not let him go until I brought him to the house of my mother into the chamber of she who conceived me. Now, we're talking about this church and Jesus relationship, the bride and the groom. And so it's real easy when we start thinking about the house of the mother and the chamber conceived me. It's real easy to want to begin thinking about this in the flesh between a man and a woman and the sexual thing that goes on in that chamber for conception. But that's not what we're talking about. In the church and Jesus, what is that conception? We must be born again to enter into the kingdom of God. That's what Jesus told Nicodemus in John chapter 3. You must be born again. And Nicodemus thought, well, does that mean i got to crawl back up into my mother's womb? That's what Nicodemus said. If he's, if the idea of crawling back into the womb is I have to be conceived again. Do you understand that when you can't find the Lord, instead of turning to the city, false watchmen and things, where do we go? Go back to your moment of conception. In other words, go back to your salvation. Go back to that moment of your salvation. I think of David when he talked about, you know, uh, restore to me the joy of my salvation. Sometimes that's what we need to do. We need to just stop and go back and remember. Do you remember what your life was like when you got saved? We need to, as the Bible says, put on the helmet of salvation. That helmet protects your mind. When we can't feel and when our minds wander, put on your helmet of salvation. Let's go back and remember what your salvation was like. Remember that moment you met Jesus. Remember giving your heart to him and the change that came in. And hold on. Hold on because in this moment, see, that's when you found the Lord. And hold on. Hold on to that. And don't let go of it. Don't let go of that of that point. You found the Lord and he saved you and he made you something new. 
Verse 5, I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or by the does of the field. Do not stir up love, uh, do not stir up nor awaken love until it pleases. And again, going back to these daughters of Jerusalem, that these represent these, these believers that don't really want to pursue the Lord. They don't, they're not really passionate. They're, they're sort of driven by this, you know, the, the religious system and just being comfortable. And this idea of don't stir up your love. Don't awaken love until it pleases. You see, the daughters of Jerusalem, because they don't have the passion to, to really seek the Lord, they're doing what? They're, they're in the city. They're in the streets. They're, they're caught up in the system. If they stir up love in the streets and in the city, if they stir up their love there, then they will not, they will not be pleased because it doesn't please. All these things of life will always let us down. Only Jesus truly satisfies. Only he can truly fulfill us. And so we don't need to be stirring up love into false things that will destroy us. We need to awaken our love. We were ready to give it to Jesus. Oh, you sure you can awaken your love? You cannot believe me. and You can love these things. But what happens in the end is that you will not be pleased. It will not please you. Because in the end, your happiness you think you feel from it will only be fleeting. And in the end, whether it's the next day or 20 years down the road, at some point, at some point, all those things are built on like, like a house on sand. At some point, it will all come crashing down. And you will be left in, in rubbles. And you will not be pleased. Only Jesus is a rock. That never goes away. No matter what happens to you, no matter what floods of life attack you, He will always be there. And He always satisfies regardless of the circumstance. Verse 6, Who is this coming out of the wilderness like pillars of smoke, perfumed with myrrh and frankincense and all the merchants' fragrant powders? This is a beautiful picture because at this point, We've returned to the joy of our salvation and, and we found Jesus there and we hold on to him. We don't let go. You know, we, we, we wait to give our love to him in that moment. And suddenly it's, it's here. It says, and who's this coming out of the wilderness? This is the groom. And he's coming out of the wilderness like pillars of smoke. You know, smoke is a result from fire. Fire is very representative of the Holy Spirit. You know, the Holy Spirit and the whole idea of a pillar. Like a pillar of smoke. Pillars speak of strength and stability. They hold things up. And so suddenly the Lord is coming out of the wilderness, you know, like, like pillars of smoke, like the strength and stability that is a result from the Holy Spirit and the fire. This, this is the Lord. You see, it's coming up out of the wilderness. Israel, they, you know, God delivered Israel out of Egypt, but they went into the wilderness and they went in the wilderness. Why? Because they unbelief. They didn't believe and they complained and they, they didn't believe God. And so they were, they were stuck in the wilderness. It's the same thing as a bridegroom running through the streets or running through the city, always looking for something and never being satisfied. Israel is the same way. They were never satisfied. But after a generation, when they found the Lord and they dug in and a generation grabbed a hold of him, then the Lord brought them out of the wilderness and into the promised land. So when you find the Lord, when you, when you grab a hold of your salvation and you hold on to it, suddenly he brings you out of that darkness, out of that dark time of your soul. He brings you out. And when he, when he does, he's, he's like this pillar of smoke. He's like this pillar of smoke coming out of the wilderness. And it says perfumed with myrrh and frankincense. And we talked about that. You know, these anointing oils and they were, they were very fragrant. You know, frankincense, sacrificing life, and myrrh represented the, the anointing with death. And so we have the life and death of Jesus Christ coming up out of the wilderness with you. The death of our old life, but the frankincense of new life, the, 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 the anointing of the, the, the new things that he's given us. And he's coming up out of the wilderness with us. And it says, with all the merchants, fragrant powders. It goes on what about all these fragrant powders. You know, all these, remember the fragrance has to do with character. So there's all these character sm smells of God, the holiness, the love, the peace, the joy, the patience, 
all these characteristics of God, all that, that smell of character presence is upon him as he's carrying us out of the wilderness. And how is he carrying us? This is verse 7. Behold, it is Solomon's couch with 60 valiant men around it and a valiant Israel. Now, in, 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 in Hebrew customs, when the male would get married, they would carry him in on this, this, this chair, um, this, the, this couch of the, of the, uh, the New King James calls it a, a palaquin. Um, you know, sometimes it was a chair. Sometimes it's described as like a large bed. And they carry the groom in on this. And then when they, after the marriage, the bride and groom are carried out on this. Um, I know I've seen even some modern day Jewish weddings with, with the, the, the chair they carry the man in or the two chairs they pick up the groom and the bride and they carry them out in these chairs. So here's his picture of the groom being carried in and he calls it behold Solomon's couch. And of course, Solomon was his, you know, obviously Solomon's writing this and so, um, he's using his own thing, but you know, he being the, the king of the height of Jewish kingdom power, he was sort of the, the symbolic of everything that a king could be. And Solomon's couch for him, it was carried by 60 men, 60 valiant warriors. Um, not just any, but they were valiant warriors and they carried swords on their sides. And, you know, this, this represents unlimited security. This is twice the number of people that would normally be used to carry something like this. And, and just, just some interesting thing, uh, um, there were 30 and 30 on each side. And so 30 was a number for maturity. Two is the number for witness. Um, there were 60 pillars that supported the tabernacle, 60 pillars that were used in the temple, um, representing, uh, this, this stability. But there were also warriors. You know, um, verse eight, they all hold swords being expert in war. Every man has a sword on his thigh because of the fear of the night. So these two verses tie together. It's hard to talk about one without the other, but, Again, this is this picture of the groom carrying you out of the wilderness. One since he's this pillar of smoke with all these fragrances and suddenly it's this, he's carrying you on this, this couch, this bed, this chair with all these armed men with swords and you're coming up and there's this stability and security in this. There's also maturity and there's a witness to it that people can see. But all the warriors holding the swords being experts in war. This is very important because, again, we go back to the beginning. What is this season? This is the season of the night. And what happens in the night? It says because of the fear in the night. Some translations translate this instead of fear of the night, terrors by night. I believe the English standard in IV translates this as terrors in the night. The modern English version, terrors of the night. Spiritual warfare can be very intense at night. And it's not just because it's, it's darkness. There's, there's, there's a reason the demonic powers are, are much more agile at night in the darkness. Um, and it's not just because the sun is down. There's spiritual reasons for this. There's a spiritual reason why the Lord has the sun going down at the time these demonic powers do these things. Uh, I know that, 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 that early watch, that 3 a.m. watch in, in, in the night, um, when you engage in all night prayer and spiritual warfare can be extremely intense. Um, and, uh, and, and many people, they, there are people that has suffer terrors by night. And here's the word of the Lord saying, listen, he knows. And when you're with him, this is the security. There are more angels with you than there are demons against you. I mean, Satan only took one third of hell. That means for every demon, there are two angels. Heaven has hell outnumbered. For every demon that can accost you, God has two angels to stand by your side. That's just the truth. Of course, the bigger truth is, is that there's more power of God in you through the spirit than there is in in all the angels. Um, you know, one angel can put a, a lot of demons to flight. Um, you know, heaven, heaven is one. The word of God is, is greater. 
But here when you have these terrors by night, God wants you to understand that he's not only with you, but he has guardians, experts at war that are there for security for you. They stand with you. Verse 9, of the wood of the Lebanon, of the wood of Lebanon, Solomon, the king made himself a palaquin. He made its pillars of silver, support of gold, to see the purple interior paved with love by the daughters of Jerusalem. Uh, again, we're getting into this, this chair, this chariot, this thing that you're being carried in. It's got these curtains that are on it for it to give you, you privacy. Um, Notice how it's made. Now he's getting into the description of how this is made. It's around not only being carried by these guardians, but it's got this this silver and gold and purple on it. You know the 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 the, the poles on it have been built from cedar. Cedar is a very fragrant wood. Um, if you've ever opened up a cedar chest or a cedar closet, it doesn't matter how old it is, you can still smell the cedar. There's that character that comes out of that. Um, the wood, again, temp- uh, is symbolic of humanity. But the cedar, the fragrant word, wood, some translations, instead of saying cedar, they'll say fragrant wood because it gives us the fragrance. This means it's a sanctified humanity. This character of God has been given to you. See, you're no longer a sinner, you're a saint. You've been sanctified by God. The gold is sim- symbolic of the Lord's divine nature. Silver represents redemption. Purple represents royalty. And all this is done by what? The love. The love. How you're being ruled is through the love of God. And paid with the love by the daughters of Jerusalem. You know, God's wanting us to know that He loves us. He, he, he loves mankind. You know, He's bestowing honor. It's, it's, it, it's really such a beautiful picture how it's paved. And then it, it, we're getting to the end. He says, and go forth, O daughters of Zion, and see King Solomon with the crown with which his mother crowned him on the day of his wedding and the day of gladness of heart. I know when we start seeing King Solomon and, and, and the crown of his mother, it's just really easy to want to fall back into a humanistic interpretation of, oh, this is Solomon and his wife. And again, but we're looking at this as the bride and the groom. And we have to see those symbolic imagery here. And so, you know, what, what, what crown was Jesus crowned with? I mean, there's not a mother God. That's, that's not what this is talking about, but, you know, when was Jesus married? When was he crowned? Listen, the crown that Jesus wears is a crown of thorns. You see, his day that he made forth the wedding was on the cross. That was the day that he purchased you and I. It was on the cross. This is, in a sense, our wedding day. How do we, how do we become the bride of Christ? We become the bride of Christ because Jesus Christ paid the ultimate sacrifice on the cross. And it says, go forth, O daughters of Zion. See, this is different than those daughters of Jerusalem that we've been talking about, O daughters of Jerusalem. These are believers that aren't very passionate, aren't very searching, and we're giving them words about, well, don't, don't, don't pour out your love until you're ready. And those don't give your love to some, something second. You need to save it for the Lord. You need to give your passion, your love to the Lord. Here it says, O daughters of Zion. See, this isn't just, Daughters, I mean, Zion is, is bigger than Jerusalem. It encompasses more area. This is, there's, a, there's a bigger thing here. See, God's crying out to not just daughters of Jerusalem, but even to others. And we're saying, go forth, go forth and look at what? Jesus. He's got the crown. It's the day of gladness of his heart. That's why we, we, we talk about East, Easter quote week, you know, I, I know some people don't like to use the word Easter week, but that, that passion week, we call it passion week. Why, why is the death of Jesus called the passion? Are we sadomasochist? No, we're not sadomasochist. It's because Jesus looked in that last week and he could see the torture, the humiliation, the horror, the death, the pain, he could see it all. And he saw through that 
difficulty at obtaining you and me. By paying our sin, he understood that he would be obtaining, he would be winning us. And that's what Jesus was passionate about. That's what gave Jesus joy. No, Jesus didn't desire pain, but he did it for you and I. And he considered it joy to go and get us. He loved us that much. And this is how this is ends is with this thing about, you know, you know, all of Zion, look, look, he's crowned with the crowns. It's the day of gladness on his heart. So let me, let me sort of summarize this. Let me, let me sort of bring this up in summary to us. Cause I know doing this sometimes this is not like a, like a story or a parable type of a message going verse by verse, but there's always going to be these seasons of darkness in our life where we can't feel the presence of God. And we should what? We should seek God, but not, not in places we don't need to be. We don't need to be trusted in government or other, other religious ideas or something. Instead, we should turn back and remember our salvation and grab a hold of Jesus that we found on that day of salvation and grab a hold of that fact. Grab a hold of that day of salvation. Go back and restore that to you in this, in this period of night. And when you see him there, he will, he will find you. And in some moment in this spiritual warfare, he has you covered. He has your protection. You don't have to be afraid of the terror by night. He can protect you and he can be the one that will lead you out of this wilderness in glory, in his presence with all of his fragrance. And he can do that. And all we have to do is to turn and to see him that he has purchased us. He went through suffering for you and I so that in this moment of darkness we can grab a hold of him and we need to declare that not just to the daughters of Jerusalem but to quote the daughters of Zion the people of the world the people in our city those watchmen those people in the streets those people in the city that don't know they need to know that the love of God calls out to them let's pray Father I thank you God for your word that we're going through the Song of Solomon, and we can see your passion that you have for us, God. And even in moments when we can't feel you, you are there, and you love us, God, and you protect us, and you fill us with your fragrance and character, God. Lord, help us to help us to cling to you, God, and not seek out other things, God, for you alone satisfy, and you alone bring everything uh, that brings fulfillment to our life. Lord Jesus, we love you. Thank you for this time of growing more intimate and close with us. In Jesus' name. Well, we thank you for listening to this teaching and this word. We will continue with chapter 4 next week. If you've missed one or want to hear other teachings, you can check those out at our website at www.christianimpact.net. And until next time, God bless. Oh.